Sleepy Sheepy here. Today we're going to be looking at poise, trading, hyper armor, and a little bit of poise counting. We're not going to go into super close detail with relations to data and understanding like hyper armor calculations or anything like that, but we will talk about kind of the ways we can get advantages in PvP when understanding the poise system a little bit better. So this is going to be aimed at newer or intermediate players who just want to understand, you know, what poise they should run with most builds, when it's advantageous, when it's not, and just how to understand the concept as a whole. To better understand these concepts, we'll be looking at three different setups. The first two setups are going to be very similar. They're going to be low poise builds. So you can see right now I have 30 poise with this armor set. And honestly, I just picked kind of the silliest fashion. What you run is not super important, but we will be running weapons that are pretty important. So the first one we're going to look at is going to be a weapon with a lot of hyper armor and a lot of poise damage. So this means you're more likely to stun lock your opponent and you're more likely to maintain your attack animation through attacks from your opponent. That's essentially what hyper armor means. It means you get poise while you're in the attack animation that is unrelated to the poise of your character. And then we'll also be running the clean rot knight sword, which is gonna be low poise damage and have no hyper armor. And we'll see how it's difficult to maintain priority in a low poise build situation when you aren't able to deliver a lot of poise damage yourself and you don't have a lot of hyper armor. We'll take a look at the third setup a little bit later in the video and you can check the timestamps if you want to skip ahead, but let's first go ahead and jump into the PvP content with this low poise setup. All right, so this first invasion is going to start out as a 2v1, but will turn into a 3v1 as another player spawns into the world. And right now I'm dealing with two different weapons that have pretty close to maximum poise damage. So even though they are being one-handed, I'm pretty much guaranteed to get poise broken by any hit that comes my way from both a greatsword and a halberd. But we have somebody with twin blades coming in and those do have lower poise damage. So they are going for jumping attacks, which are gonna deliver a lot of poise damage. But if they go for just light attacks, I'll be still likely to get poise broken because I have low poise, but if I had higher poise, I wouldn't have to worry about it quite as much. So there we can see I get kind of blendered a little bit. So I get hit twice and stun locked twice, and then I'm able to roll out, and then I get hit twice and get stun locked twice, and I'm able to roll out. So it's worth understanding when you do get blendered, you will almost always be able to roll out after two stun locks. And that's because Elden Ring doesn't want you to get just continuously comboed indefinitely where you have no chance. But here I'm able to go for a nice use of hyper armor with Giant Hunt. So despite getting hit by the Halberd while I'm mid Giant Hunt animation, I still complete the attack because I have innate hyper armor in that attack. So that's gonna change depending on the weapon that you're using, but using a Colossal Sword, I do get hyper armor and it turns out to be pretty useful. So that's gonna be just something to keep an eye out for when you're trying to learn like the intuition of whether or not you'll be able to tank incoming hits or not, and if you're gonna get poise broken or whether or not you'll be able to kind of complete those attack animations. And that's super helpful to understand in the long run. We're now looking at a 2v1, which is a lot easier to handle. And I'm going to be trying to stun lock my opponents as often as possible and also roll catch them. So if I can roll catch them, I'll maintain priority. Basically, they won't get a chance to stun lock me first and I can continue my aggression. And eventually I'm able to use just a little bit of the natural hyper armor of the weapon during a crouch to not get poise broken during the attack from the twin blades and come out on top. The Twin Blades also have very low poise damage for their initial hits, but their later hits have more poise damage. So that was a factor there as well and allowed me to just get that crouch poke to finish both opponents at the same time. So next up we have a 3v1 and this is gonna be just kind of a demonstration of how to play when you have opponents that are likely going to stun lock you. None of them have very high poise damage weapons, but we are running very low poise, so we're gonna get stun locked. And kind of the danger there is that when you have two players that are using low poise damage weapons, they're likely to be fast weapons. And so that means you could probably get hit by a bunch of different hits very, very quickly and continuously get stun locked, even if you are able to get 
you know, roll out of it, you'll be more likely to get roll caught and then the combination will kind of continue indefinitely. So it's important to really take advantage of your ability to stun knock your opponent and not get caught by too many of their attacks. So you're seeing that I'm playing kind of passively and then just waiting for the right opportunity to grab those attacks. And here you can see I was in an attack animation for a heavy attack, but got stun locked out of it from the jumping heavy of my opponent. And had I started that heavy attack a little bit earlier or released the attack a little bit earlier, I would have hyper armored through it. But because I was still in the charging animation, I didn't get to finish it, but I was able to hyper armor through their later attack with giant hunt. So next up we have a 2v1 again in the area outside the Radon boss fight, and this is going to, you know, again, we're trying to stunlock our opponents frequently and not get stunlocked ourselves and just kind of get comboed too often. So here I go for a quick talisman swap just so I'm less likely to get hit with a bleed proc because I do see that bleed is kind of in the mix and something like Eleanor's pole blade is going to be a little bit dangerous. So that player went for a charged attack, but my jumping heavy had more poise damage in its animation than they had hyper armor for their charged attack. So they didn't get their attack off. And then I was able to combo that into a giant hunt roll catch, which, you know, took care of that player. So now I'm dealing with a low poise damage weapon, but I also have low poise. So it's going to be important to just kind of pay attention to my spacing and not get too aggressive. In that moment here where they kind of went for their jumping attack, had I swung a little bit earlier, they would have been knocked out of that animation because they wouldn't have the poise to tank that, even though a jumping attack does have some hyper armor. But the poise damage that my heavy attack has is going to be more than the jumping attack that they're, you know, in the process of delivering. So uh, a good moment there just to understand how that interaction worked and ended up being a trade. And then here we can see, again, I'm charging my heavy attack, but haven't released it and get stunlocked by just a twin blade hit. So had I had more poise in that moment, I probably wouldn't have gotten stunlocked and I would have been able to turn that into a trade. And we can see in that moment where it would have been useful for me to have a little bit more poise on this build, but we still see we're able to kind of negotiate the incoming damage and the play styles of these opponents with the added benefit of hyper armor and kind of high damage associated with something like a colossal sword so it is viable to run lower poise builds with colossal swords because you have natural hyper armor here's another moment there where i had the startup of giant hunt but wasn't able to actually land it because i got stun locked by my opponent and that was just you know, kind of a showcase of hyper armor doesn't happen instantaneously. It happens at a certain point within the animation. And I got stun locked out of it. Had it been a little bit later in the animation when I went for giant hunt, if I had gotten hit by that sword hit, I would have tanked it. But because it was just still in the startup frames, it didn't work like that. So understanding when you have hyper armor within your attack animation can also be important because it's not guaranteed to be instantaneous and something like Endure is going to have much, much faster kind of infinite poise than something like, you know, Giant Hunt, which has some startup frames. And Giant Hunt is kind of an interesting one where the hyper armor depends on the weapon you're using. You're more likely to get stun locked out of Giant Hunt if you're using something like just a single spear than if you're using a Colossal Sword. So next we have just one duel with a player using dual great so or Colossal Swords. And here we can just see the amount of hyper armor I'm able to utilize with the Giant Hunt Ash of War and get hit by both their attacks but still come out on top. Next we're going to be switching over to the low poise damage and low poise setup with the thrusting sword and here I'm getting hit with a high poise damage weapon and because I'm guaranteed to get stunlocked by either of their weapons I have to be very careful but eventually I am able to stunlock them continuously and they needed to roll in this position because they had low poise so every single one of my hits would stun lock them and if they were going for a trade or let's say an attack out of that they were not going to be able to get it off because my weapon was faster so in that moment that was a dangerous situation for them to have low poise and I could really take advantage of that fact you'll also see me using the heavy attack a lot so in this kind of 
situation here where I'm dealing with a player that has hyper armor and a weapon that can deliver a lot of damage, the Colossal Sword, I don't really have much of an advantage. I'm guaranteed to get stunlocked by it, and they're unlikely to get stunlocked by just a regular light attack with this thrusting sword, which means maintaining priority is going to be super, super difficult. So I kind of need to use something like heavy attacks. So running heavies are great on thrusting sword, just so I don't get hit with a trade because if I just go for a light attack, even if they start their attack animation after me, I need to roll out immediately because they'll just be able to continuously kind of swing and land their attack and I'll lose those trades. So eventually I do land a couple of heavy attacks as well as get the frost proc since this is cold infused. And with those kind of added benefits of the stunlock, I'm able to come out on top there. So it's not too difficult at this point. I realize that this player is kind of just turtling behind their shield and going for straight sword attacks that don't really deliver too much damage and they are fat rolling. So it's not too much of a challenge to just kind of finish them off. I also have the benefit of the fact that this is cold infused that will go through the shield, but eventually they don't really manage their stamina well enough and get guard broken. So we're able to come out on top there but the the phantom in that particular invasion was definitely something to worry about and it was very difficult to use this build against them next up we have a 3v1 and here we have a player with low poise so i don't poise break them every single time but i'm able to actually grab kind of a weird backstab here as they're just rolling away from me and now I'm in kind of a tight spot where if I kind of stayed in that area, I think I would have just been blundered, especially with my low poise. And we have a couple different fast weapons at play here that make poise breaks on my end much more likely. So a curved sword is, you know, going to poise break me. The cypher peta fist weapons are also going to poise break me. And that makes this difficult. However, the advantage that I have is that my opponents are also running low poise. So this is just kind of a full mix of low poise setups and it makes it a little bit easier. If my opponents had high poise, I would have been really in a tough spot because they would pretty much just have continuous priority where they would be able to attack me out of an, one of my attacks, even if they started their attack after mine because they wouldn't get stunlocked by mine and I would get stunlocked by theirs, so then the priority would kind of shift over to them. But in this case, we are able to, you know, kind of trade more effectively. We will see a little bit later, I'll try to trade with the Cypher Peta, but because the Cypher Peta attack animation is gonna be faster than the Thrusting Sword animation, they maintain priority even though we're both getting stunlocked. So eventually we do try to, you know, maintain health. We're in like a very bad spot in terms of the environment. There's really nowhere to go and there's lots of stuff to get tripped up on, but we do get the Frost proc on the Phantom and then a couple stun locks allow us to finish them off real quick. So coming up, we're gonna have that kind of continuous trade where I understand very quickly that I don't have priority and roll out. I get hit twice and I go for another light attack and they get their attack out faster than I do. And that means that I need to back off, but then I can just kind of space them and go for the extra range that I have with the thrusting sword and come out on top. So this last one, there's not a ton to really understand about poise here, but it was just a flawless invasion, which I was pretty happy about and had a nice parry. So we have some players that are using Reduvia Bloodblade, which is very strong, especially at level 60, which this build is at. So I don't want to just kind of run up the hill and get hit with Bloodblade. And so I go for some attacks with the Jar Cannon to kind of bait them down the hill. I appreciate the kind of serpentine movement we have from the player with Reduvia Bloodblade, but I'm able to stunlock them and then parry their incoming attack and just kind of back off. So at this point, the kind of setup that I need to go for is just continuous stun locks on my opponent. And I know that if they hit me with their curved greatsword, they're going to also stun lock me. So I really just want to win out on trades and kind of predict their attacks and punish, you know, whiffs or really whatever type of movement I can. So I'm able to finally roll catch them at the end there and just kind of come out with the W for that particular one. But in terms of trades and poise and hyper armor, not too much to note.
This next setup is gonna be a very high poise setup. So we'll be running 111 poise. To get that, we'll need the bull goat talisman as well as some pretty heavy armor. The armor you choose is not super important, but having over 100 poise is gonna be pretty helpful for withstanding most attacks unless they're a guaranteed poise break. So I have some data related to poise damage and I'm gonna link it in the description, but it's important to understand that different weapons are going to deliver different poise damage and some weapons are going to guarantee a stun lock so something like a great sword is going to guarantee a stun lock regardless of the armor you're wearing and that is just important to understand in this context but it's also worth noting that you can get hyper armor and extend your poise through attacks that would normally poise break you with different ashes of war so something like storm stomp is going to be a really good one because you will hyper armor through an attack and then prevent your opponent from moving with the kind of wind animation around you, and then we will be able to usually land a hit. However, there's a couple different caveats because Storm Stomp only delivers 100 poise damage. So if your opponent is running over 100 poise, then you'll tank the hit that they deliver on you, but the wind animation around you won't stun lock them, which means that they'd be able to roll out if they wanted to. So that's going to be pretty useful, I think, in terms of better understanding where poise and stun locking and hyper armor work together within a high poise build. All right, so this first invasion is going to be over pretty quick, and it's going to just kind of demonstrate what happens when you have kind of infinite priority, which you don't exactly have when you're running Storm Stomp and a high poise setup, but you do maintain priority very easily. And we can just see that the players get stun locked very quickly from Storm Stomp. I'm able to tank incoming poise damage with Storm Stomp because it gives you some hyper armor. And I'm able to just deliver some poise breaking attacks as well as some non poise breaking attacks. But overall, it's just kind of consistent damage. And if you play aggressive against it, it's going to really be detrimental. So we'll see that again here. I'm able to get a couple quick hits in and then go for a chase down. When they're in low space, I go for Storm Stomp and negate the damage and poise damage from my opponent and grab pretty much both of them simultaneously. So here we can see just the poise working. They are going for an attack with the spear and I can just poise through it and land some attacks, come out on top with a trade and then land Storm Stomp again to get a little bit of extra damage off on the host. So here again, we're able to stun lock the opponent with the poise breaking Storm Stomp. If they had been running higher poise, they would have been in a better position. There I do almost die, get hit with blood loss and I'm poisoned at the same time. So if I hadn't healed in that moment or if my opponent had stayed more aggressive, they definitely would have won in that instance. But there's a little bit of lag going on and I need to kind of be careful about this setup. The damage from the swords aren't actually that high, but the amount of blood loss we can get hit with will be pretty substantial. So I also turn on the lantern just because the lighting in here is kind of bad and I knew that this was going to be a clip. So I wanted to just kind of make this as good as possible. We have kind of high blood loss buildup. So I go ahead and use another Ballas and I'm really just trying to find a good moment where I can really stun lock my opponent, hit them a few times, and not get blood lost myself because that is something I very much need to worry about. The blood loss proc will stun lock me regardless of the hyper armor of the uh, storm stomp. So it's just important to understand what the limitations of your particular Ash of War are. Endure is something that you can actually hyper armor through a blood loss proc, but that's pretty much the only way that I know how to do that, unless you're going to like perfect block or something, which is outside the scope of this video. So here we're able to take care of the Phantom pretty quickly, and we have a player that's using dual straight swords, and those have some low poise damage compared to some other weapons. So here we're able to continue our jump attack. We didn't get poise broken out of the air and we were able to land that jump attack and really just maintain pressure. And it's really useful to be able to not get hit out of the air and land your jumping attacks. And so some weapons are gonna be considered better for anti-air, you know, really just your ability to take your opponent out of the air is super helpful when trying to avoid incoming damage. And something like a scythe is gonna be a great weapon for that. 
and it really counters something like straight swords very well because it has a pretty quick anti-air attack which is going to guarantee your opponent will be hit out of the air and the straight sword player is often going to be going for jumping attacks so here we see just how much uh how difficult it is to play with slightly lower poise and lower poise damage weapons. Essentially, I needed to switch my talisman away from the bull goat talisman so that I could use my other talisman, which would ensure that I wouldn't get madness proc as quickly. And especially at lower levels, it's much, much easier to get proc with madness. So in this invasion, you'll see me you know, getting stunlocked much more than you normally would on this build, but because I had to make that talisman swap, I do have to deal with some of the low poise damage stuff. So the fact that the quick attacks from the dagger are hitting me pretty often and they're stunlocking me is, is definitely a problem. And I need to just kind of roll a little bit more than I might, and I can't be quite as aggressive. So despite the fact that this is a very aggressive playstyle build, I can't really utilize that as well, and that's why it's struggling uh, a little bit in this particular invasion. So, you know, not talisman swapping off from Bulga would have been helpful, but you kind of are dealing with a give and take when it comes to dealing with madness as well. And if you have different talismans, you know, it, it might be more beneficial to you know, not swap away from the high poise one, but in this case, that was kind of the route that I took, and if I had more invasions, I probably would have used something like the Crimson Amber Medallion and used that instead of the Bulgo Talisman. But we are able to kind of reset back to neutral a little bit and run in and just get real aggressive. There, I got hit with the startup hits from Vike Spear, and those weren't enough to poise break me, which meant I could poise break my opponent and just kind of continue with some aggression for a little while. And here I realize that I'm out of heals, so it's a little bit more dangerous and I need to come in. And if I can maintain priority on the Phantom, which I was able to do mostly because the host went for a flask at that moment. So that ended up being very helpful. And here I go ahead and talisman swap away from the one that will negate some of the madness buildup and switch over to my uh, Bulgo talisman. It's less important now because I am dealing with a weapon that will poise break automatically, but had my opponent stuck with some of the lower poise damage options, it would have been pretty helpful. So in the end, when it's just a one-on-one, -on -one, their aggression isn't going to do them any favors, especially when they have a slower weapon and I'm able to poise break them instantaneously. Next, we have a duo. One's using fists and a parry shield. So I switch over to the Cestus just because I thought it would be fun to kind of go for a mirror match here. And I'm able to vortex them a little bit. They're getting hit with the heavy attack, which is pretty strong. And they go for a lot of parries, which is not a bad move against something like the Cestus, but if your timing isn't right, you're probably gonna get hit for a lot of damage. So it's pretty important to land that. And I'm trying to vary my attack timing so that I don't get parried. And now we have a player with low poise as well as a low poise damage weapon. And we can just kind of look at how effective my setup is compared to theirs because I don't have to worry about getting stance broken by their attacks. And I can basically just continuously use Storm Stomp, catch their quick step and come out on top in those moments. So it's really advantageous to be going against low poise damage weapons if you have a high poise setup. So here we have a quick 3v1 where they're kind of waiting at the top of an elevator, just kind of ready to go and attack me. They don't do a great job of, you know, kind of coordinating, so I'm able to kill one phantom pretty quick. And then here I was able to just kind of tank a hit with an anchor with Storm Stop, the extra hyper armor, and then get priority for at least a couple hits. I do need to roll out, but I can, you know, use Storm Stomp again once they have kind of released some of the pressure from the situation and I'm able to take care of the other phantom and now it's just a one-on-one -on -one with the host. They're running again a lower poise setup and have a low poise damage weapon so really I can just kind of trade indefinitely with them and don't really need to worry about too much because they'll need to roll out of any situation and I can just kind of land my hits. They start rolling a whole bunch but we are able to just kind of catch them with a single light attack and come out on top. All right, so we've looked at three different setups and that kind of begs the question, what's the right amount of poise to have and what type of poise damage do we need to do? And the easiest way to play the game is to have higher poise. There's no question about that. If you get stun locked less frequently, you're gonna be able to maintain priority in more trade situations and it will be very helpful. 
However, you don't necessarily need over 100 poise on every single build. You can play the game a little bit more intentionally and with a uh, slightly higher skill ceiling if you are open to it. So playing with above 69 poise is going to be kind of a general middle of the road situation where you can tank something like dual straight swords, at least one hit from those, and that will be useful, but you're going to get stun locked more often than if you had over 100 poise. You do need to worry about things like Storm Stomp and Flaming Strike. So I feel like that's a great way to get better at the game is to play with something around, you know, 69 or 70 poise because you'll need to be very intentional with the way you deliver hits, but you're not going to constantly get blundered by really fast weapons. And then you also can play at lower poise. You don't need to have above 69. You can you know, use something like a Colossal Sword, which has an eight hyper armor, and really get a deeper understanding of the mechanics from that front if you want. So I don't recommend against playing that way. I think you kind of saw in the first invasions that it was effective even with low poise to use that type of weapon. And you just need to be a little bit more conscientious of kind of your trade situations when you're going to have that hyper armor when you're not. But I think you'll learn a lot more about the mechanics if you give that a try. So that's kind of my general recommendation. I don't think you need to play with super high poise and super high poise damage all the time. It will be easier to play like that, but it's not necessarily going to give you the most information about the depths of Elden Ring's kind of PvP mechanics. So I wanted to talk a little bit about poise counting, but we're not going to go into depth too much. And I'll link another video that has a really good kind of visual associated with it. But poise counting is essentially the practice of understanding that your opponent might have a certain amount of poise. And if the weapon you're using isn't going to instantly poise break them, you'll kind of count the amount of poise damage you've done over time and understand when they're going to get stance broken. So. An example of that would be to be using something like Storm Stomp, which has 100 poise damage. And if your opponent has, let's say, you know, 111 poise, then this is not going to poise break them, but it is going to still deliver that 100 poise damage. So that'll bring their kind of effective poise down to just 11. So the idea is that you might use something like fan daggers, which have five poise damage associated with them, hit them three times. So you've delivered 15 poise damage. And that means the next hit that you land will bring them under the 100 poise that you want to hit them with. So hitting them with three fan daggers is you know 15 and then you hit them with storm stomp and that's 115 poise damage total they'll get stance broken on that storm stomp because they've already had their poise decreased by those fan daggers so it's a little bit complicated you have to kind of understand just by looking at the armor your opponent is wearing and assuming that they have bulgo talisman on or not and just kind of have a very good understanding of how much poise damage certain things do. So I don't think this is really a beginner thing. It's something that you'll see a lot at really competitive level duels and not so much something that you'll see at just kind of, you know, normal invasions and just normal arena play. And it's really useful. Like if you notice that Storm Stomp isn't poise breaking your opponent, and then you just hit them with a few fan daggers. It doesn't have to be like full on calculations, but you may want to throw some fan daggers in their direction if you plan on going for Storm Stomp soon. And this is very common as well for something like Flaming Strike, which has a follow up associated with it, which can be, you know, only really landed if you do stance break your opponent with the first part of the Ash of War. That pretty much covers everything that I wanted to say in this video. If you have questions about poise or anything like that, definitely let me know. And if you wouldn't mind considering subscribing, I definitely appreciate it. But yeah, that's all I've got. And I hope you have a good one.